My name is Laurel Ruma. I am the Director of Talent at O'Reilly. And my name is Nellie McKesson, and I am the eBook Operations Manager at O'Reilly. So, if you can't open it, you don't own it. This is an actual slogan from Make Magazine, which is a magazine that we do publish along with technical books with different various programming languages. We also run conferences. We do all sorts of technical content. But this is not just a slogan. Being open is absolutely part of our DNA at O'Reilly. And the importance of being able to say this and know that it's absolutely true is really important because that's one of the best reasons, that I, that's one of my favorite reasons that I work at O'Reilly. So if you can't open it, you don't own it. And we are talking just for this uh, context of this conversation. Open is anything, uh, or I should say, uh, a device is anything that you consume content on, right? So it could be a phone, it could be a laptop or a tablet, it could be your car. And content is anything that's created. Movies, music, books, newspapers, journals, really anything. And the importance of open formats and open devices is really paramount, especially now. But first we have to take a step back and talk about 16th century England. And, um, oh sorry, before I do that though, we have to talk about Richard Stallman. We always have to talk about Richard Stallman first. <laughs> And of course, the obligatory beer slide. Um, so free software. So when I talk about free, I mean open. I mean liberty. Not necessarily free as in beer, but we will have some of those examples later on too. So free, open, liberty. And uh, the importance of this is really paramount. And you talk to the Red Hat, get, Red Hat guys, and they understand it. Open source software is obviously both free as in liberty and free as in gratis. So 16th century England. Um, this is when we started seeing the rise of pirates. And they were not necessarily the ship-faring pirates that would steal all your, your booty and redistribute it. It was actually uh, book pirates or printing, print, printer pi pirates that would take this information away from the small group of people that would hold this information and keep it to themselves. They would decide what, cre what content was created. They would decide how it was distributed. They would decide who it was distributed to. And this was a perfect model. Top-down economies are always perfect models that are ripe for disruption. And this is where the printer pirates came in. Printer pirates were not looking at distributing content as a way to be like awesome and make a lot of friends and do this for free because it's just kind of cool on the weekends. No, no, they were doing this to actually make money. So what kind of content do these printer pirates want to distribute? Bibles, law books, alphabet and grammar books. The kind of content that actually makes a society a society, that makes people learned, that makes people understand how to read and write, and then be able to read those law books to say, I really don't like that law of the land. I'm going to change it. I'm going to start a revolution. This was a really, really important time. So it took that model of top-down heavy economics and flipped it on its head. The power was coming up. The people now had the content. People were able to create, distribute, and consume whatever content they wanted. They didn't have to wait for people to decide what was great for them to consume. So these pirates actually had a couple practices that turned the economy around. They made the content distributable. Everyone could have it now. They actually created and, and provided a better choice of content, which was really great, because then you could actually consume whichever version of the Bible you wanted. And thirdly, they actually created a market for pricing, so people could afford this content. And being able to afford content meant that more people could read it and then share the, those ideas. Because an idea is only so good unless it's shared. This sort of sharing actually created the innovation economy, right? Because when you're starting to share ideas, you're starting to improve ideas, you're starting to change ideas, and that's when you create innovation. And then once you create innovation, the innovation economy is not that far to follow. So what happened when the government found out about uh, these pirates is that they would raid the black markets where all this information was being sold. 
So imagine having to buy your Bible on a black market. And they would burn the printing presses and burn the books. So this sort of behavior was definitely seen as treasonous to the government and those in power. And the tricky thing is today, we're not looking at a terribly different environment. So it's 2012, and we have publishers, movie houses, record industry running to the government saying, please, 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 we need to do something about this content because it is being shared and we are not making our money. We have decided not to innovate. We have decided to stick to those old ways of doing business. We've decided to stick to that top-down economy. And now we're in trouble. Because the problem is modern-day pirates are not actually out to make money. They don't actually create a market. They just release all this information for free, and free as in free as in beer. So it drives down the costs of all other goods to as low as possible. You were kind of really looking at a serious time in, the, in, in our society of how we actually want to consume this content. We we're faced with digital rights management, which is a type of restrictions that you can put on content. So again, your movies, your music, your books, your journals, your newspapers, and as a way to stop it from being shared. So once you start stopping the sharing of information, you really, you're saying this is it. The second thing that is incredibly disturbing are these forces and companies that all of a sudden think it's a really great idea to lead us up the path to the walled garden with a shiny device. <laughs> Once we get to that walled garden and that gate slams behind you, you are trapped. This is a walled world. The device that you choose will absolutely control the kind and what content you were then able to consume. The publishers, the record houses, the movie houses, these, this top-down tyranny well, can actually then start to distribute whatever they want to you in whatever version they want to you in whatever form they want it to be. So you create, they create this content, they produce it, they distribute it, and you consume it in a closed channel. So that means, once again, if you can't open it, you don't own it. You may think I'm getting a little crazy about this. Not so much. In 2009, Amazon, don't forget, recalled two books from Kindle users' Kindles. Anyone remember those two books? 1984 and Animal Farm. Two seminal works by George Orwell. And if you haven't read 1984, I demand you go home, you get a copy, <laughs> you open that awesome beer you brought back from Portland, and you read it this weekend because it'll blow your mind that of all the books in the entire world, Amazon could decide to take back from its users. It was the one about Big Brother and how society could monitor every thought you were having. So this is actually really important. This is not, I'm not you know, crying in wolf for no reason. What we need to look at is how we ensure file formats, devices, everything stays open. So um, another good story, uh, Julie Lehrman is this fantastic technologist in the .NET community, and she's written a couple great books. And she wrote an email to me and said, hey, Laurel, you know what? Um, my book is being pirated. It's on the torrents. And it's also, it was just posted to a .NET user group in Pakistan. What should we do? Let's see. Do we send a cease and desist letter? Hire a bunch of lawyers? Publicly shame? <laughs> publicly shame the guy, you know, for posting this book for free? Or four, burn down the internet. So just like those printing presses, we restrict the way that this information is being distributed. No, we do none of those things. Because in all honesty, obscurity is the worst kind of security, right? So we are not trying to keep stuff hidden. because so we know people are going to find it anyway. And they're going to take it. And they're going to do what they want with it. So in this particular case, um, the .NET user group had posted the book, Julie's book, to share it with their users to be able to talk about it at their .NET meetings. It's kind of really hard to argue with that. So I said to her, I said, Julie, I think next time you go to Pakistan, you're going to have a loyal following 
Um, and she also came to the realization that she said, I guess what the book really is, is a chance to create a world, uh, to sharing the book really was a worldwide community service. So when we look at piracy like this, yes, it's awful romantic. We absolutely can justify that all day long. And one of the reasons we can justify that is that we're still able to make money. At some point, that may tip, and we may not be able to. So let's just talk about Jack Sparrow for a minute. Um, this here is a perfect example of why the internet is great. This photo is a photo of Jack Sparrow, and it says, Yar, I just met you, and I'd be crazy, but I'm your captain, so call me matey. So if you're not familiar with Carly Rae Jepsen's Call Me Maybe song, oh my god, after you read 1984, <laughs> go to YouTube and start watching all of the takeoff and ripoffs of, of Call Me Maybe. Yeah, it'll take you all, after, all, all weekend. So what, what we have here actually is an interesting study. We have a still image from Pirates of the Caribbean, which you could say is actually a copyrighted material. We have an image of a real person, Johnny Depp. And we have um, a spin-off or a take-off on a popular song. And it's all wrapped in this lovely little cat type package, which only the internet can create. So by themselves, all of these things are OK. Johnny Depp, OK. Pirates of the Caribbean, OK. The third one, not OK. Um, call me maybe, it gets in your head and you can't get away from it. But you put it all together, it goes from OK to awesome. This is what happens when we have an open society, when we have open culture, and we have an open ability to take content and actually make it better. Um, <laughs> so, so we go from, from discrete things to better things. And uh, like that is really what the internet does, right? It exposes information to more than just a few people. It exposes information to the world and the big wide world that we have. So if you have an internet connection, you really do have access to anything. So how do we restrict this? Like how would the movie theaters or movie chain come after this image? They can't, so you gotta let it go. At some point, you just got to let it go. Um, but uh, this idea of a remix culture is really important. So Larry Lessig is a professor at Harvard, and he has this idea that our culture is currently read-only. And what we miss by have being a read-only culture is the ability to write back, right? So what we need to do is build a read-write society <coughs> where people can take great things and make them better. Um, so here we have world sorry, real world Haskell. And uh, this is another example. So the authors decided to basically say to the community, hey guys, girls, we're going to write a book and we are going to do it with you. So everything is gonna be open from day one. They posted chapters, they took <coughs> feedback. Community members post, you know, uh, tested code and gave back feedback and comments. There were more than 2,000 comments on this manuscript, which is absolutely unheard of in tech book publishing. It's great if you get 100, but having in your entire community kind of feedback this, this information was really valuable. So when the book was published and it was ready to go, of course we printed it and distributed it in all of our ebook formats. We have a, a printed copy of it, it's great. But the book is still available for free to download on the internet. You can do it right now, don't do it right now, you're gonna break the Wi-Fi. But you could if you wanted to. What's funny is this book is actually still available on the torrents. So, but what you get from torrenting this book is just a copy of the book. You don't get the wiki, you don't get the forum, and you don't get the awesome community that wrote this book with the authors. And now you're saying, well, that's nice. Free documentation, great. It's not free, this is free, but there's also a free as in liberty aspect to it, even though this part is free as in beer, we were still able to charge money and this book actually sold quite well. So yeah, you could get it for free, but also sold really well. And Haskell at the time, not so, not so popular. And even on uh, Drew's chart, we saw Haskell was still pretty far down on those language lists. So it was actually a really, really pleasant surprise. And it's not actually terribly surprising. So at O'Reilly, we um, have a open contract. So we posted our contract for authors on the web first, 
and only, really. And all these other publishers came after us, and they're like, why would you ever do that? You're selling state secrets. And they all said, that's crazy. This is the contract between us and the author. Anyone can look at this. We also release books under Creative Commons. And um, this is not an unusual experiment by any means. Um, however, you could say not all authors are super awesome, really, really excited about this type of thing. And uh, Eric Freeman, he was the CTO of Disney, and he's one of our very popular authors. And he said, you know, this DRM thing isn't great. Books of my, sales of my books are not great. I think, because your books are DRM free, so sorry, I should step back, O'Reilly has no digital rights management on our content. You can read it anytime you want in any kind of format on any device. Yes, we'd love if you paid for it, <laughs> but yay. Don't forget, this is what makes us different too. We are one of the only publishers that does this, and this is a bragging point to us. So get back to Eric. So Eric was like, I think my sales of the book are declining because you allow content to go out on the web and it has no GRM. And we said, Eric, we can't actually find that correlation between loss of sales and DRM. What a loss of sale is that you can kind of look at and say, that looks pretty obvious to me, is the rise of sharing websites like Stack Overflow, like GitHub, like Google, which basically you enter any question you want and it comes back up. And what we have is a economy that's completely changing. People no longer want to pay $60 for a book. They want to pay for a question, maybe, or service, or whatever. And that is what is decreasing sales of books, not necessarily digital rights management. Because I got news for you. Pirates, 16th century to now, I mean, they would tear out pages of books and photocopy them. They would scan them. As long as there's been an internet, there's been a way to exchange information for free. And that is the cost of doing business. And Tim O'Reilly you know, famously said that in 2002. He said, um, Obscurity is worse for authors than any kind of piracy, and that piracy is a form of taxation. And the way we look at that is that if you can't evolve your business model to respond to these kind of economic pressures, well then yeah, you're not going to do well. But if you look at piracy as a tax, you can make adjustments for that. So one last story, um, of course, Double Rainbow. If you hearken back to 2000, and the era of Napster. Metallica was the first band to sue their fans. They sued three universities, Napster, and more than 20 users, uh, fans, who were distributing their music. If you contrast that with Radiohead, which in 2007 released their famous album In Rainbows on the web in various formats, you could um, download the entire thing as an e as um, as an audio file, and you could pay whatever you wanted. You could also buy the CDs. You could also buy albums. You could kind of buy the content in any way you wanted, and you could support the band in any way. The band did really, really well. And granted, it was direct to cu customer selling, but the point was, if you contrast that with how Me Metallica handled it, and don't forget, Metallica didn't necessarily learn their lesson because they followed up one year with distributing their new CD to only Walmart. Only Walmart. So you can fight the internet, or you can save your money, save your energy, and instead create innovation and not waste it running after pirates. Because if you can't open it, you don't own it. So uh, when Laurel asked me to help her with this talk, she asked me to help her with the tech side. Um, but as I wrote it, I realized that was what was more interesting to me was actually the ideas behind what's happening. Um, I am not a social science major, but I am a philosophy major. Um, so you're not going to see a single chart or a single line of code in my presentation. And you've all had a few beers anyway, so that's probably for the best. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we have all of these people who are in a panic trying to figure out how to make money off of their content, and publishers who are tearing out their hair because their books are online for free, God forbid, um, and they respond by adding DRM. And there are a few technologies that really drove this disruption. On the surface, you have the iPad and the Kindle, 
Um, but what really is behind those is the internet and markup like HTML. So with the internet, people have more access to more information faster than ever before. People can download a file onto their iPad or their Kindle and get it instantaneously and start reading it. And these files are all built with HTML. You may not know that, but uh, EPUB files, which are what you read on your iPad, and Mobi files, which, you, which are what you read on your Kindle, are all just a collection of HTML and XML files. So this digitization of content and the digitization of content distribution is really wreaking havoc with that old power structure where content creation was siloed in the hands of just a few people. You had the publishers and the author and maybe some copy editors. Um, and then they worked on the book and then they distributed it down to the masses. So now you've got the internet and HTML and these new central roles and that power structure is disrupted. Um, first off, for publishers, because where once they were the only ones who could create this little packaged text document, now anybody can. Uh, the truth is making a book is easy. Making a really good book is actually pretty hard, but not everybody needs a really good book. Um, and I'm kind of trivializing here the difficulties of making an ebook. It actually is kind of tricky, um, and I still, I do this for a job, and I still run into surprises here and there. Um, but if you bring in services like Vook, or Amazon's CreateSpace, which is their Kindle self-publishing program. These are people who have built their business on the web. They have tons of web development experience and they understand these technologies better than the publishers do. And they're taking these technologies and making them accessible to the public. This is terrifying for publishers. Suddenly this package that they've identified as their product is available for anyone to make. Anyone who has an idea can make this little package and send it out into the world. And the publishers respond by adding DRM, which is, what does that solve? It does nothing. These people are still gonna make their books and send them out there. Um, and the publishers are making it harder for their own books to be found and used. Because the truth is packages are always going to change. Uh, we saw this consistently throughout the history of the printed book. So there was a time when Print books were bound in these big long rags that people would like tie onto their belts so that they could carry the book around and like show people. And eventually that evolved away and the print book became what we know it to be now. And the same thing is happening with ebooks. So right now we have EPUB and Mobi files, but eventually those will evolve away probably to raw HTML and then to something else that we can't conceive of right now. The package is irrelevant. It is the ideas that matter. People want ideas, and they want the content, but they do not need the book. They can find those same ideas for free in a million places on the internet, probably faster than if they were looking inside a book. I can sit down and Google for some specific question and get the answer super fast, and yeah, I'll probably have to sort through some craft and I might follow some red herrings. But it's easier than reading a book cover to cover to try and find that same answer. This is scary. <laughs> this is scary for people who have built their livings on um, publishing content and publishing books. Because it changes the financial value of the idea. So you have all of these ideas out there for free. All of this content is out there for free. I think I learned uh, in high school that this is just called supply and demand, right? You have all of this stuff out there for cheaper, so the value of the printed idea um, goes down. The counterpoint to Laurel's story about, uh, about uh, Julie Lerman and her Pakistan user group is author David Flanagan, who wrote a bunch of books about Java and JavaScript. And he wrote this great uh, blog post about how disappointing it was for him to Google for any of his book titles and find every single one of them available for free on a pirate site. And sometimes those pirate results were ranked higher than the actual legitimate bookstores. So the result was that he couldn't make a living as a writer anymore. He had to go out and get a day job. Those old power structures where the author was the expert and he dispensed this knowledge down to people are being disrupted as well. So where someone once was able to make a profession as just being a knowledge base because of the internet, 
and the availability of information, um, that profession is less and less of a viable option. The community expects to be invited into the content creation process. You have precedents set by sites like Stack Overflow or Wikipedia, um, where people, anyone can be an expert, anyone can answer a question, anyone can help create these knowledge bases. So the trick for publishers and authors is to find new ways to monetize their own ideas and their own value add. Because authors, they are still experts and they do still add a lot to this knowledge base. Um, but it might not be just writing a book that they package as plain text in a file. What, where's the value there? So instead it might be conferences, it might be building platforms for these communities to gather around. Um, it might be creating new products that no one ever thought of before, new ways to present information that no one does, like interactive content, truly, truly interactive content, not just slapping a video inside a file. Uh, that's not interactive. <laughs> Um, and I don't want to pretend like I have all of the answers. If I did, I would think I'd have a lot more money and be a lot more famous than I am now. But uh, it is time for a pivot. So we have the community, and they want to be involved in the process, and they expect to be invited in. We've seen this in a lot of different industries already. We saw it in medicine with sites like WebMD, um, where suddenly people had access to vast, vast, stores of uh, medical data and uh, information. And what happened was um, they began to challenge their doctors and the doctor was suddenly sort of challenged in his role of the expert and suddenly had to have conversations with people about their health, God forbid. Um, and yeah, some people screwed up. Some people tried to self-diagnose and got it wrong. But the value that it added overall to the social to, to the social good uh, was fantastic. Um, so we should try to harness these communities. We need to harness these communities and harness that vast communal database of knowledge that is out there. Um, one example of someone who's done this is actually my dad. He's a professor of marine engineering at the University of New Orleans, and instead of a textbook, he put together a wiki and he put his lecture notes on the wiki and he put his syllabus there and he gave the password to all his students and he asked them to contribute to it throughout the semester as he gave his lectures or as they did their research. Uh, this wiki is totally public to view uh, and it's totally free. And I was actually talking to him recently and he was complaining that his students don't contribute as much as he would like because they are lazy students. Um, <laughs> but my response to him was, what if you gave the password to your peers as well? So enter a tool like GitHub. This is already an awesome tool for coding and, and open code creation. You've got people forking, branching, merging, pull requests. So what if we wrote books in the same way? This would be a truly collaborative document that was alive and searchable on the web that anyone could add to. Um, and it really, makes a reality of the promise that, that Stack Overflow and Wikipedia and other sites like that made. Um, Clay Shirky gave this really great TED talk, I think a few years back, about how this is already happening with government documentation, where people are moving government documents onto GitHub and creating really democratically authored government documents. As tech people, it is crucial for us to have a well-informed audience. Um, and it is crucial for us to keep our documentation up to date because how can we ever expect people to adopt our languages and our products if it's not well documented? If it's not well documented, it's not going to get used or at least not to its full potential. Um, so, <laughs> back to pirates. So there are a lot of great opportunities and challenges out there for us right now in this industry. Um, uh, there are lots of problems that still need to be tackled. The problem of annotations and files is a huge one. So how do you add a note to one file and have it transfer over to all of the different formats that there are of that same file and share that with the public? Um, even the question of what the best way to consume information is. What is a book? Is a book relevant? These are all open for debate and it's a huge, huge uh, 
huge landscape of uh, opportunity. <laughs> um, so the best thing to benefit the public good and to really drive innovation, and the best thing for publishers and authors as well to really advance themselves and set themselves up to survive is to tackle these kinds of problems instead of spending all of their money and resources chasing pirates. Because as Laurel said, uh, pirates be pirates, so do the right thing. Thank you.